Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let me welcome each and everyone that is tuning in tonight to another session of Bible study. Amen. And we, you know, pray that, you know, the Spirit of God be with us. And we pray, God, that his anointing be upon us, you know, to just talk to the hearts of his people because, you know, we are living in serious times. You know, we are going through a pandemic right now. And at the same time, I believe that there is a pandemic as it pertains to lack of the truth, lack, lack of, you know, preachers preaching and teaching the truth. And, you know, we, we have a scarcity of the word, so to speak, you know, because men, you know, in this time, you know, rather to preach something that will cause individuals to shout and to feel good rather than telling people about what Jesus wants them to hear. As we get in the word tonight, we just want to open with prayer. So just bow your heads and just pray with me. You know, and even as we go through the study, I want to encourage, you know, those watching in and those who are tuning in to, you know, just breathe a little prayer now and then, you know, because, you know, you present the word, you're going to be under attack. So just breathe a word of prayer. And let us pray right now. Father, we want to thank you again, Jesus, for bringing us here today. Lord God, you have spared us yet again, Lord, from tropical storm grace. Oh God, we pray right now, Jesus, that you will just continue to bless us, your people, and continue to bless us even as a country. And we pray, God, that as a people we will embrace your words, and that we will embrace truth, and that we'll stand up, God, for this faith, God, that you have called us into. Lord, we are living in a time where many great Jesus fall prophets and false teachers and false preachers, God has set up themselves, Lord Jesus. They are set up by the enemy, God, to deceive many. But we pray, mighty God, that you will keep our hearts and that, Lord, we will not be pulled away by a lie, but we will hold to your unchanging hands. We pray, God, that as we get in the study tonight, that you will accomplish your will. Lord, that you will speak to every heart. God, give us grace. Lift our faith. Strengthen us that we can hold on to truth. Let your will be done tonight as we indulge in this topic. And we give you thanks right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so as usual, you know, we're going to do a little bit of recap. You know, God is extremely good. You know, yesterday we had some rain, you know. I was wondering if we would have Bible study, but God is a good God. Um, nothing major, you know. Some roads um, got digged up, and we understand that, you know, that will happen when we have so much rain. But, you know, God is a good God. Amen. You know, so earthquake happening in another country, and so many lives were lost. And, you know, God keeps fearing us, and God keeps fearing us. And even when something comes, it is not that detrimental. And I believe that as a country, we are a praying country, and I believe that, you know, there are people in this country that know the true and living God. And I believe that we should continue to pray, continue to, you know, talk to God on the behalf of our country, of our leaders, and even those who, you know, we consider a menace to society. We, you know, just want to bear them in prayer because, you know, it is not his will, the Bible says, for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. So we want to get in the word tonight. And we want to look at the scriptures. Amen. And the first scripture that we are going to look at is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirit and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God had created to re be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Then we look down now at 2 Timothy 4. 
verses 1. So Paul, you know, you talking to Timothy, and we would have went through, we would have talked about it already, that, you know, Paul, as he spoke to Timothy, you know, he was telling him that, you know, there is going to come a time where men, you know, will move away from the faith and that they will give heed and to the doctrine of seducing spirit. But then here now in 2 Timothy 4, we read where now the apostle now charged Timothy. And he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Amen. So we have been talking about doctrine and you know, we have been saying many a things. Last week, we really talk about, you know, I mentioned that I like what the Bible says, you know, when it, it, the Bible will tell us what to do. Jesus will tell us what to do through his word. But one thing, he will not force us to do it. Amen. He will not force us, you know, that we should make the choice. And we mentioned the scripture last week when we talk about the Bible. The Bible says, that enter ye through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that lead to destruction, and there are many that go by it. Because narrow is the gate, the Bible says, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few that be that find it. I want to encourage the church tonight that you make sure that you be in the few that find the narrow way. You make sure that you are in the few that stands in the narrow way because it is the narrow way that is going to lead to life eternal. The Bible says, enter the narrow gate. You know, and I like the Bible tells us what to do. And it's the same thing with doctrines. The Bible tells us the different type of doctrines that exist. And then the Bible also tells us about the apostles' doctrine. And the Bible tells us that we should choose the apostle doctrine. Choose truth. Follow truth. Right? If you want to know truth, then you must know Jesus Christ. Because he's truth. Amen. And so we look last week and we talk about the, 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 to, to be able to identify, you know, true Doctrine from false doctrine or sound doctrine from false doctrine, you know, because as individuals we should be able to identify, right, what is true from what is false, what is true from what is a lie. And it's important that as church, as people that are called by the name of Jesus Christ, that we be able to, you know, talk about the truth, but that we be able to identify when truth comes to us. And a way that we can identify truth is by the word. But we look at the true, true versus the false doctrine. And, you know, we must be aware in Luke 22, 31 to 32, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desire to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. I want the church to know tonight that we're Ever you are in the world and you are watching and you are a part of the church, I want you to know that the devil desires to sift you like wheat. But I have been praying. There is a burden in my spirit and I have been praying and I have been saying, God, keep us, your people. Help us not to entertain any kind of false teaching, any kind of false doctrine because we can be swayed and we will find ourselves being involved in things that we should not be involved in. When you are around a lie, you will find that, you know, you will do things that will cause you to walk outside of the presence of God and you want to make sure that you are able to identify, you know, what 
these false teachers and, and what false doctrine entails and what true doctrine entails. But I want you to know that the Lord said, Peter, the devil, desire to sift you like wheat. But he said, I have prayed for you. I want us, those who are praying people, those who know how to pray, to continue to pray for the church, to continue to pray for the saints. You know, and, and just before, I'm just going a little bit as I feel in my spirit. You know, like we said two weeks ago, that one of the things that the pandemic is doing is that it's keeping the saints away from the church. And I'm feeling in my spirit, I have to be trying my very best to, to make sure that I get the thing together because I don't want when the rapture sounds that I am not in it and if we are not careful we're not we're not coming out of church as we used to and you find that folks are falling away and 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 giving heed to doctrine of seducing spirit and we have got to be a weird church in times like these as children of God we must be able to identify you know, false teachers and false teaching. And to do so, we must know what to look for. And as we just do a quick recap, you know, we said one of the things that we should look for, and we mentioned it last week, that, you know, we should look for the origin. Where does the doctrine originate from? We said that sound doctrine originates with God, right? The apostle, when he wrote to the Galatians, we said, went through great length to to have them to understand that, look here, what he was preaching to them was not of himself, but it was of God. And we mentioned that scripture in Galatians 1, 11 to 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it of any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So we say that if you want to know true doctrine, you must look where it originates from. This apostles' doctrine that we embrace as apostolics, I want you to know that it comes straight from God. It comes straight from Jesus Christ, straight to the apostles, and the apostles leave this heritage for us. And as Christians, we have got to stand in this heritage, and we have got to be prepared to fight to maintain what was handed down to us. So true doctrine then originates with God. And then we said false doctrine originates with anything else other than God. So it can by, be by spirits or it can be by a man that is influenced by, still come down to a spirit. So just as true doctrine is marked by its divine origin, false doctrine is marked by its worldly origin. In Colossians, Paul make mention to the Colossians, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world ye are subjected to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments of, and doctrine of men. So you will find that there will be doctrines that come from men. And, and just as though the Holy Spirit will inspire men to write and, and inspire men to, to, to research and to preach and to teach. So it is that men get their inspiration from demons and they come up with these type of doctrines that is there to sway people away from the truth. But if you want to know the true doctrine from the false doctrine, then you first must look at its origin. And the true doctrine originates with God, and the false doctrine originates with anything else other than God. The second thing that we mentioned that we must look at is the authority. The authority of sound doctrine is grounded in scriptures. Amen. The word of God, the Bible, is sufficient, it's complete, it's authoritative, right? And it's from which true doctrine can be established. We mentioned the scripture in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished, equipped for every good work. So sound doctrine, it originates in the thought, it originates in the mind of God. And its authority lies with God. Also in 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 13, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when he received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it as the word of God and not of men. Amen. So the authority that the doctrine comes from is from the word and the authority is come from God himself. The Bible is the word of God. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So sound doctrine originates with God in the mind of God. Amen. And Paul said to the Thessalonians that, look here, we thank God that you receive the doctrine that we brought forth to you and you receive it as the doctrine of God. So far, on the other hand, false doctrine grounds its authority outside of scripture. False doctrine grounds its authority from outside scripture. Two persons can be teaching from the same passage and both claim the authority of the Bible. Really, the authority of false doctrine comes from Satan himself. False doctrine is a lie, and Satan is the father of lie. And we mentioned the scripture in John 8, verses 44. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the de desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. And this, amen. So the authority that false doctrine has comes from Satan himself. It comes from out, anything else outside of Bible. So true doctrine gets its authority from God through the word. Then false doctrine gets its authority from outside of the Bible. Then when we talk about consistency, so when you put... The, 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 the true doctrine, true the test, and you look at consistency, you recognize that true doctrine is consistent throughout scriptures. True doctrine, amen. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verses 9, and the Bible talks about strange doctrine and teaching. Paul wanted, amen, to tell the, the church in Hebrews about the consistency of the doctrine through scripture. Paul also warned Timothy about accepting different doctrine. 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 6. And both times the apostle emphasized you, that, that we should look, that Timothy should look at the consistency of Doctrine and the scripture bears the consistency of doctrine. The word, when we talk about the true doctrine and sound doctrine, it must match up with the word of God. So it must be consistent. Amen. We'll also look at the scripture in Isaiah 29 8, 9 to 10. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And this was in the Old Testament, and we mentioned that. He said, Whom Will he make to understand doctrine them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precepts. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. So the Bible is saying to us that true doctrine, who shall we teach true doctrine? Those that come off of the breast and, and those that are able now to eat hard food. Get into the word of God. And he said, line must be upon line. Precepts upon precepts. Here a little and there a little. So, amen. The authority, the consistency, sorry, the consistency of 
true doctrine, of sound doctrine. When you put it against scripture, you recognize that it is consistent. It preached the same message. But on the other hand, when we talk about false doctrine, we recognize that it is inconsistent. False doctrine is inconsistent throughout scriptures. You know, sometimes some folks, you know, they will use one scripture and they will, you know, this is what their doctrine hinges on. But I want us to know that in order to identify false doctrine, we have got to look at the consistency. When we put it through the consistency test, we recognize that sound doctrine, we recognize that true doctrine, amen, is consistent throughout the word of God. But when we look at the false doctrine, it is inconsistent. Amen. When we look even in the book of Acts that we mentioned, Acts 16, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? And, and, and the apostle said to them, Believe on the Lord and thou will be saved. Some folks just take this and they make their doctrine and say that all somebody must do in order to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was the same apostle in, in, in further down in the scripture that says they took the man and his family and baptized them. I want us to understand that to, to, to identify the, the, these false doctrine, uh, we may need to put it in a test against the word of God. And when you see that it is inconsistent, in the word of God. That is the time that you are going to know that. Look here. I need not to listen to, the, to this person. Because what he's saying. Is really false. Then we say that true doctrine. Will. Is beneficial. To spiritual health. In other words. It give, cause one to grow spiritually. Sound doctrine makes. One spiritually healthy. Spiritually mature. And become knowledgeable Christian. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Knowledge of the word to overcome the wicked one. You know when Jesus Christ was, was tempted by the adversary. It was the word that Jesus Christ used to overcome, to overcome the adversary. And it is similar to us as Christians, as a babe in Christ. And we don't, just, we, we don't know the word so, 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 so fully. You're going to find out that sometimes some things happen and we don't know the word. But then when we become mature Christian and sound doctrine will bring us to that mature stage. We will know from the word be able to resist the adversary. Because now we are able to quote scriptures. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So when the adversary would come in like a flood and try to mess up our mind and mess up our thought and mess up the things that we are trying to achieve under God, we can say that all things work together for good where it might look painful and, and the adversary might cause you to feel down. But look here, all things work together for good to them. And we can use the word to comfort ourselves. And so... The doctrine, true doctrine, sound doctrine brings spiritual growth, right? And the things that we used to do, we do them no more. So if you look even at yourself and you know that you're involved in, 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 in truth, you find out that some things that you used to do, you're just not doing them anymore. Any man being Christ, the Bible says, is a new creation. But you're going to find out that, you know, a certain time after a certain time pass. You're going to find out that you change because your thinking is changed. And, and we're going to go down into it because you're going to find out that you will do the things that you think. I don't want to run ahead of myself. But you will do the things that you think. The things that you have on your mind, that is the thing that you will do. And you're going to find out that when we... As children of God, when we grow, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So when we, 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 when we start growing spiritually, recognize that your, your thought change and, and you start think about 
things that are more of God. But on the other side, false doctrine don't promote spiritual growth. False doctrine leads to spiritual weakness. Because remember I said last week that this false teaching and false doctrine have a way to us who you and to the soothe you. And when you get involved, you're going to find out that now everybody around you is doing a particular thing that, hey, it will just be looking like the norm for you to do that thing. And, and you're going to find out that when you get swayed into false teaching and false belief, that they will cause you to do things that is not scriptural and that they will turn you from the true and living God. The, not, the next test that we said that we should do to identify true doctrine from false doctrine is to look at how people are living. I see a video the other night and that video is as if the people were in a, a building called church, people were in their church clothes and is a dance hall, and them say it's dance hall church. And in there had a lot of people. I see another video some time ago, and these people were downtown, and they were, they were doing the dances of the world. They were dancing to the music of the world. And I am saying to us that church, when it comes to true doctrine, true doctrine will cause people to live godly. Sound doctrine has value for godly living. Truth never stands on its own, but always has an implication in life. Doctrine is always meant to lead to doxology, worship, and purposeful living. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof. Paul then charged Titus to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Reminding him that such doctrine is excellent and profitable for the people. Titus 3 verse 8 and Titus 2 verse 1. So sound doctrine promotes Godly living without God expects people to live for him. And how is it that we are going to live for him? The doctrine must tell us how to live for him. When we look at a doctrine and we're going to look at the makeup because there are some things that is really on the periphery. But they are important because while the apostles doctrine mainly talks about Jesus Christ and about his death and burial and res resurrection and ascension. We are going to find out that there are some things that, like, like how we live and how we dress and how these things come together to form one big doctrine, so to speak, that the apostle presented to us. And you can't talk about doctrine and, and, and living by the word without talking about love. You can't talk about doctrine and living by the word. We don't talk about how we attire ourselves. It is just a part of the entire thing. And as people of God, we can't make up our faces when we hear somebody come and talk about living. It is coming from the word and somebody talking about dressing. The Bible might not say certain things, but we can find the principles in scriptures. To guide us how we live. So godly, so, 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 so doctrine, true doctrine promotes godly living. Amen. While on the other side, false doctrine promotes ungodly living. False doctrine leads to ungodly living. And Jude 1 verses, Jude 1 verse 4, or Jude verse 4 tells us that false doctrine leads to ungodly living by causing folks to believe lies. I want the church to understand tonight that doctrine is a serious thing and as children of God living in this day and age we must be able to identify must be able to identify what 
good doctrine teaches, what it entails, and what false doctrine entails. This is how we are going to be able to identify the enemy. You cannot be on a battlefield, somebody, and cannot be able to identify the enemy. The enemy will sneak upon you, even if he's a wolf and he might have sheep clothing, for him come near you, my Jesus, you're going to recognize that when you are in the spirit, you're going to know that the spirit, your spirit and that spirit can't be here, can't mesh. So it can't be of God. So while it's important to come to church and while it's important to be dear and to worship God, whenever you get the chance, I want you to understand that as people of God, we must be living in the spirit because the Bible tells us that there is wolf in sheep clothing and you've got to be aware that the adversary will not relent and he will go through all the lengths and breadth of trickery to deceive some. And as saints of God in this time, we are too near to our heavenly home to be deceived, too near to see Jesus face to face to be deceived. We have got to make up our minds. We have got to be, to, to, to be convinced in our souls that look here, what we are involving is truth. And nothing can draw us away. I wonder how is it that some folks, you have experienced the Holy Ghost. And this is how cruel Satan is, you know. Some folks have experienced the Holy Ghost, but have gone to a place that tells them that, look here, the Holy Ghost, um, once you believe God, as you believe God, so yes, you have the Holy Ghost, without any evidence of speaking in tongues. And there are some, I have seen folks that receive the Holy Ghost and has gone to another place that don't believe in the Holy Spirit any at all. This is the reality that we must understand and accept that this is the reality around us and we can't afford to allow any, not this time, not now, not when the signs, hurricane, tropical storm, earthquake, things just happening. Oh Jesus, all that is happening in the Middle East, everything is not now, we can't allow anything to draw us away, no. Amen, somebody. So we also made mention about the, the unbiblical, the extra biblical, the biblical base. And we just mentioned last week that we as individuals, that we must understand that even though the thing that is not written verbatim in the Bible, we must recognize that once the principle is there, it is enough for us to take uh, as part of our doctrine, it's enough for us to live by. So we may mention and the Bible did not say, don't smoke, don't smoke a spliff, don't smoke a cigarette, but the Bible tells us that our body is the temple of the Lord. So we can use it for smoking and we can use it for other things. The principle is there. And I am saying to us that from the principle is there, it makes sense that we obey the principle. We also look at the scripture in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33. He said, Be all the days come and say the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, when in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, with my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will 
be their God and they shall be. Look here, I want us to understand that if it's not written word for word in the Bible, God put the Holy Ghost. Do you know? And people that are living for God, you can identify. Do you know that there are some things that it's not written in the Bible, but to how God can you about it? You can't do it. And I'm saying to us that folks are fighting the spirit. Their consciences are alive through the Holy Ghost. And they are fighting the Holy Ghost. So when you dress a certain way, I mentioned it last week, and you put on certain things, and you have to be fighting your conscience. That is alive. Because you have the Holy Ghost. You have to be fighting your conscience and say, look here, yeah man, I look proper in it, I can't wear it. And you're fighting your conscience. You're going against the leading of the Lord. If you have to fight your conscience to do it, don't do it. So I want the church to know tonight that not everything will be written in the Bible. It will not be written word for word. But we have got to know that from the principle is dear. One of the ways to please God, the Bible says, is that we are to walk in the spirit that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 16. Church, I want us to know tonight that it might not be mentioned verbatim in scriptures, but once the principle is there, we can take it as doctrine. If it is holiness, the Bible tells us about it. If it is modesty, the Bible tells us about it. If it's how to love, how to live, to please God, enough is in the scriptures. Amen. For us to live for God. Bless the name of Jesus. So sound doctrine then is important. Amen. Sound doctrine is important. I want us to know that doctrine is important. I said two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we opened this subject, that the Bible spent so much time, Jesus inspired men, and, and, and men wrote, amen, and Jesus himself, while he walked this earth, spoke about doctrine. If doctrine was not so important, then the Bible would not place an emphasis on doctrine. I want us to know that when you hear folks telling you that you should put away the things that your forefather have given unto you, I want you to know that that is coming out of hell itself. And folks, when you hear folks saying that you can put away your doctrine, understand that they are going against the word because the word tells us that we should abide in the apostles' doctrine. So why is sound doctrine important? We looked earlier on last week and we recap and we said that you know, you're supposed to look at the, the, the different things, uh, what the sound doctrine entails, what the true doctrine entails, and then what the false doctrine entails. But why is sound doctrine important? Sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on a specific message. You're taking notes? Sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on a specific message. And we're going to look at Hebrews 11, verses 6. I want us to know that sound doctrine is important. Our faith is based on a specific message. We must bear in mind that we serve God by faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verses 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that God is, and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that God exists, and that God is a rewarder of them that seek him. So when we come to God, the first thing that we do as individuals is that we believe. If you don't believe that God exists, you, you can't come to God. 
So the first thing that we do as men when we hear the word of God is the word of God cause us to believe that there is a God and that God exists. Sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on a specific message. So when we believe God and we believe on him by hearing his word, then doctrine now we get is important because of the message, the specific message. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, Verses 17. So then, faith comes by hearing, hallelujah, and hearing by the word of God. So then, faith comes by hearing and that by the word of God. Remember now, the first scripture tells us that any man comes to God must first believe that God is, but you can only believe on God when you hear the word. So faith then comes by hearing and that by the word of God. When the word of God is teached, when the word of God is preached, then men understand and men now believe in the true and living God, that God exists. And it is because of the word of God. And it's important that the word be ministered because when men hear the word, they believe. So then it is by hearing the word of God that we believe in the message that is presented about Jesus. It is by hearing the word of God that we believe in the message that is presented about Jesus. Amen. Sound doctrine is important because our faith is based on, our, on a specific message. We are saying that sound doctrine is important because of our faith. Our faith is based on a specific message throughout the overall teaching of the church. It contains many elements, but the primary message should be found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. 4 I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according, hallelujah, to the scriptures. This is the message. This is is the message. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried, rose again on the third day according to, not based on our sin, not based on what other men say, but according to to the scripture, this same scripture that we said is profitable for doctrine, is profitable for reproof, is profitable for correction and instruction in righteousness. So Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and he was buried, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. What a message. This is the message. This is when we heard that um, we were in sin and a man died, came and died and gave his life for our sins, gave his life in our stead. This is why we believe. Because the message was ministered, was preached unto us. It is important to our existence, the church. It is important for the saving. This message is important for the saving of soul. It was the message that was preached on the day of Pentecost. And it is the message that should be preaching today. But the problem that we are having is that there are so many preachers that are not preaching this message. Hallelujah. I sat and I listened to an interview the other day. 
homosexual was in the church. And this person was saying that, look here, I preach the word. I don't offend them. In church, where is the message about salvation? And that is why I am telling church that we spend our time and we watch some of these. I would rather, I would rather, you see, to teach Sunday school than to be preaching to millions and teaching to millions. And when they called me to preach and teach, they said to me, look here, you can't mention nothing about baptism in Jesus' name. Don't mention about infilling of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues and living a holy life. Don't mention that. But just tell people how the, the, God will bless them. Tell people how that God will keep them. Tell people how God is going to bring them out. But when it comes to the message... Hallelujah. The message is not being preached anymore. And I want to challenge preachers. I want to challenge preachers that preach on this side of the vineyard. Make sure that you stick to the message. This is the ambiguous good news. And it is of utmost importance. Change the message. Listen to this. Change the message and the basis of our faith is shift from Christ to something else. So because we hear the word, our faith is now in Christ. Uh, uh, Christ died for us. That is the message that we heard. He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. But if we change the message, oh glory. The, 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 the focus is now shifted from Christ and shifted to something else. The message has changed. Today we are living in a time church, the people of God, where the message has changed. It is not about the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. It is about me, myself, and I. It is about my asset. It is about wealth. Yes, God is going to give you wealth. Yes, sow a seed. Oh, glory to God. I come to bind some spirits in the name of Jesus. Look here, Holy Ghost. I'm not preaching, but look here. There are some, look here, there's a gentleman that lived in close proximity to my house. And I've seen that man for years. One room made out of concrete. And this man has a fridge and a stove. And this man, he was not, he's not safe. But look here. This is how wicked the false teachers and preachers are. They got this man to sell his stove. In one stove. Sell him fridge. In one fridge. And give them the money. I pass Sunday after Sunday and see this man <laughs> blowing wood fire. And the time is such where you tell them about the truth, tell them about Jesus Christ dying for them. They don't want to hear that. But tell them about how they are going to get the blessing. Tell them to sow a seed and they are going to get the blessing. That is what men are believing now. And preachers and, 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 and these seminaries when you are through in some of these seminaries these men know what to come and tell you these men under the leading of satan know what to come and tell you and cause men to believe and i'm saying to us church that if we are not careful we will find ourselves in the same position so it is not about the message of jesus christ dying and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension. But it is about me, myself, and I. It is about my asset. It is about wealth, sowing a seed. It is about having hope in the things of this world. And the message has shifted. Preachers and teachers, the focus should be on the death, 
burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wonder why in, in, in such a time, it, it, the Lord would just impress upon my spirit to, to come and talk about doctrine. Yeah, I believe that the time is ripe and God is getting ready to, to take a people out of this world. And we have got to hold on to sound doctrine. We have got to hold on to that which is passed down unto us. If we are not careful, even the very elect might be deceived. So our eternal destiny depends upon hearing the word of truth. Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel of our salvation. Let us look at Ephesians 1 verses 13. Christ died and rose again. In whom he also trusted. After that, he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that he believed. He was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, in whom also after that he believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Then let us go down to 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 14. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved, by the Lord. Because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth to which he called you. By our gospel to obtain, to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So both scripture is saying to us that we believe when we hear the word. And Christ sealed us. Our eternal destiny depends upon hearing the word of truth. Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It is when we hear, we believe. Faith comes by hearing and that by the word of God. Amen, somebody. So sound doctrine is important because our faith is based upon a specific message. Amen. Number two, why sound doctrine is important? It is important because the gospel is a sacred trust. Sound doctrine is important because the gospel is a sacred trust. And we dare not tamper with what God has given to us. We dare not tamper with God's communication to the world. The Bible is the, 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 the instruction, uh, and they said the acronym is the basic instruction before leaving hurt. Right? So God give his word to us. And we dare not tamper with it. And what we are seeing now is that these false teachers and false prophets uh, and false prophetess, they have no, even though they might use a scripture, but they're changing up. The essence of the word of God. They're taking the truth and they turn it, it into a lie to deceive men. So our duty as preachers and teachers and witnesses is to deliver the message. The same message that we talk about Christ died according to the scriptures. Buried rose again on the third day according to the scripture. Our responsibility, our duty is to teach the word. 
Paul said it to Timothy. Preach the word in season and out of season. And our responsibility is to present the gospel as teachers and preachers and witnesses. Our responsibility is to deliver the message and not to change it. Because the gospel is a sacred trust. Jude, let's look at Jude 3 and 4. Jude conveys an urgency in guarding the secret trust. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you. And exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was one deliv once delivered unto the saints. Why? For there are certain men crept in unawares. Who were before of all ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. A license to sin. And denying the only Lord God. And our Lord Jesus Christ. He said I felt I had to write and to urge you to contend. For the field. To contend there carries the idea of strenuously fighting for something. To give everything that you got for this thing. Why? Because there are certain men crept in unawares, crept in we are not crept into the world that we are in, crept into the house of God, and their sole purpose is to bring down the house of God. I bring our mind back to the story of Troy. Troy walls were unbreachable. And the other nation that they were in war with, they make this big horse. And the warriors went inside of the horse to, to, to hide themselves. And the people of Troy pushed this big horse in there and they were celebrating that the God gave them victory over their opponents. Not knowing that in the night, these warriors came out and they attacked the city from within and Troy fell. I want us to understand that Jude from that time saw it. And Jude was saying to us who are in the church that look here, their men will creep in unawares. Just come into our midst. And they would want to turn the grace of God into a license to commit fornication, to commit adultery. To sin and just behave as if it is nothing. And denying the holy Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The epistle of Jude was written to Jewish Christians that were living in Jerusalem at that time. In the opening passage, Jude explained... That he had initially intended to write a general letter about salvation. But then he said that he felt burdened to write and tell folks that they must contain for the faith that they hold to. So Jude's concern was the faith, the good news, the same thing that we were talking about, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. The gospel, which at that time was under attack from false teachers who were spreading dangerous airsays. I want us to understand 
that so it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. From that time, men were there trying to destroy the works of the church, trying to destroy the church. But I heard Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. That scripture is just on my heart from me. Shall not prevail against it. So from that time, the apostles wrote and said, look here, the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And Jews said, men will creep in unaware. I want us to know that it happened from that time. And today, church, it is no different. It is still happening now. The church is still under attack by false teachers. I want you to know that if a man set up something called a church and him set up a building and, 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 and him, him do some things and him go there and him read the Bible, people go and consider it as a church. And when they do things that is contrary to the scriptures and people go there and see it and know, them go and say, what kind of church this? It is an attack on the church. So we on this side might look at it and say, but it is an attack on the church because guess what? People are not going to separate and say, look here, that church is, they're going to put us all as the church. And I want you to understand that when we see those things, it is an attack on the church. These false teachers, these false prophetess, these false prophets, they are teaching lies that come from Satan himself. And it is an attack on the church. So it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. From the days that the church was founded, from the days that the church was established, the church has been under attack because of false prophets. False teachers, false preachers, false prophetess, whatever they want to be. False apostles, whatever category they want to put themselves in. If you are not teaching the message of the death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. If you are not preaching the message and you are preaching something else, something that is inj and things in this world, you have changed the focus from Jesus Christ and you're not teaching, you're not preaching the truth. Today, right now, this faith that you are in, you have to fight for it. You must Fight for it. Fight and you must fight. And Jude said, contend for the faith. Fight as if your life depends on it. Fight because your salvation depends on it. Fight because this is the only truth. Fight because it is a sacred trust that is handed down to us. Since this faith was entrusted to God's holy people, all believers, whether it be church leaders, whether it be saints, you consider yourself to be a, just a saint, the least among the apostles, whoever you might be, but you are in the church. You are called to defend the truth of Jesus Christ. To defend the truth of the Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you have to be in an argument with somebody. But to defend the truth of Jesus Christ, like we said last week, you're supposed to know what you believe and why you believe it. And you're supposed to stand up on that. Though we are an angel preach any other gospel unto you, let him be a curse. So you can talk, but you're not talking to me. Because I am fully persuaded that what I am in, in the truth, I am not searching for anything else. So if somebody is searching and they want to give you here, fine. But I am not searching because I have met the man Christ Jesus. If you had known me before I knew him, then you would have understand 
why I'm telling you that I have found the man Christ Jesus. Let us look at Galatians and we say it. Galatians 1, 6 to 9. Though we are an angel, preach any other gospel unto you. Let him be. He said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The same death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we've been talking about, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel. Paul talk about it, just said Jew talk about it, you know, and Paul know and said there will be some that pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. You know what happened to some of us? Some of us have spiritual colic. Spiritual running belly. Spiritual indigestion because you listen to he, she, and the old lady. And, and when we are trying to bring you and upbraid you in the truth, you open up your ear and you listen a lie. And so you're confused. Because one preacher is telling you this and the other preacher is telling you that. And you're not understanding that you are listening to somebody that is turning the word, twisting the word of God. As we said before, so I say no again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that he have received, let him be a curse. The faith that is entrusted to us by God, this faith that we must contend for is grounded in Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word was made manifested and dwell among us and we beheld. He is the word and he is the one that gave up his life in our stead. When the righteousness of God demanded justice, Jesus Christ was the one that gave up his life in our stead. In, in him we live. In him we move. In him we have our beings. Jesus is his name. And today we that are in the church of God must contend for the faith. We are in the church because of his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And as people of God, we must contend for the faith. Sound doctrine is important because it was entrusted to us. As people of God, God entrusted this gospel to us. The teaching and the preaching and, and the witnessing, whatever it is, God entrusted. He, he called you to this family, called you to this flock because he trusts you and, 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 and he entrusts you with this doctrine and it's been look your son you know that you accepted this is time for you to tell somebody else don't water it down the gospel is a sacred trust the third thing why sound doctrine is important it is because what we believe affects what we do sound doctrine is important because what we believe affects what we do. Have you ever heard the saying, belief kills and belief cure is a popular saying in Jamaica? In other words, what you believe creates a reality. Sound doctrine is then important because what we believe affects what we do. Behavior is an extension of theology. And there is a direct correlation between what we think 
and how we act. For example, a Christian and a sinner. Take for a Christian and a sinner. The sinner will do sinful things. And it is just the norm to a sinner. Smoke a spliff. Drink till they get drunk. And such the like. And it's just a norm. Because this is how they think. And because of how they think, these are the things that they do. On the other hand, if we look on the Christian, the Christian will do things that are Christ-like. Because the thought process have changed. Let us look at 2 Corinthians 4. Verses 4. So now that we are saved, we wonder why people live in sin. Yeah, we were in sin, you know. But now that we are saved, we are wondering why people live in sin. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 4. It says, In whom the God of this world had blinded their minds, Blind them the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded their minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message. About the glory of Christ. Who is the exact likeness of God. So while we're wondering. Why the sinners can't see it like how we see it. It is because the God of this world. Has blinded their eyes. But now that we are saved. Our thinking has no change. And so. Such were some of us. Our behavior was similar. Because it was how we think. But now that we are in Christ, our thinking is different. Amen. The Bible says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so it is because of the renewing of our mind. Why? Our behavior has changed. Our behavior is an extension of what we Believe. The scripture in 1 Timothy 10, sorry, 1 Timothy 1, 9 to 10. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for warmongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured, for, per, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. The, the, the scripture concludes with whatsoever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In other words, true teaching promotes righteousness. Sin flourishes where sound doctrine is opposed. This is why I told us last week that look here. When you get drawn away, when you get drawn into something that is not true, you will find yourself doing some things that is contrary to the word of God. Sound doctrine will tell us the ways of God and transform our minds that we might be able to live how God wants us to live. We live what we believe. Sound doctrine is important. 
because we live what we believe when we teach, when we preach, when you are in a place that preaches and teaches the truth, you will now live the truth. You will now live the way that Christ wants you to live. And so that is why sound doctrine is important. Sound doctrine is important also, point four. It is important because we must ascertain truth in a world of falsehood. Amen. Sound doctrine is important. We must ascertain truth in a world of falsehood. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 that Satan is the God of this world. It then in John 4, 8 verses 44, it tells us that there is no truth in him. So if he is the God of this world and there is no truth in him, it means that everything, if it's not true, it's a lie. If it's not true, it's false. And if you look around you, look in the physical, look in the physical and you will see the falseness presenting itself. When you look at mankind now, it's false eyelash, false ear, false breast, false bottom, men turning themselves to woman, false identity, women want to be man, false identity. Everything that surrounds us is false because the God of this world they are doing after the similitude of the God of this world, which is Satan. Which is the father of falsehood, is the father of lies. And so just look around you. It's just false. So they have taken the similitude of their father, the devil. But even in the spiritual, it is happening. 1 John 4 verse 1 tells us. Let us find that one. 1 John 4 verses 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. In Matthew 13, verses 25, there are tears among the wheat. They said, Master, should we take up the, the, the tears? He said, no, let's say destroy the wheat. Let both grow together until the day of harvest. Acts 20 and 29. He said, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous... No, look, look here. He said, after my departing, Shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not spearing the flock? The best way to distinguish truth from falsehood, John 14, verses 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. To know Jesus is to know truth. First John 2 verses 22. Who is a liar? But he that denied that Jesus is the Christ, he is, he is Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Sound doctrine is important because we must ascertain truth in a world of, in a world of falsehood. Everything around us, church, is presenting itself because... They are just being true to their father, which is the God of this world. is the God of falsehood. And I want us to know that as the church, we have got to remain in the truth. 
Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Point five, sound doctrine is important because at the end of sound doctrine is life. It is important. It is important. Watch your steps. It is important because at the end of sound doctrine is life. So watch your step. Watch where you walk. Watch what you take heed to. Watch how you live. We mentioned it last week, but it's important that we mention it again because at the end of sound doctrine is life. Watch your life. Watch your step. Watch your doctrine closely. Preserve yourself in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and them that hear thee. First Timothy 4, verses 16. Preaching another gospel, which is not another gospel, will not carry a man's soul to heaven, will not cause a man to, see, to be saved, but it will cause a man to be condemned. The word of wisdom in Proverbs 22, 28, say, remove not. The ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. If we can apply this to sound doctrine today, the lesson would be that we must preserve, keep it intact, and you will never stray from the truth. Sound doctrine is important because it leads to life and that is life eternal so biblical doctrine then helps us to understand the will of god for our lives it teaches us the nature and character of god it teaches us the plan of salvation through faith it instructs the church of what to do or what not to do and what is expected of the church and it tells us of God's standard of holiness. It tells us of God's standard of holiness for our lives. God expects us to live a certain way and he expects us to know how to live and he places it in the word. This is how I want you to live. It's not about what you want, but it's what, about what God wants. When we accept the Bible as God's word, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When we accept the Bible as God's word, we are on a good path. We are on a good path to know that, yes, our doctrine is, is in the Lord. Our doctrine is centered around Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, 20. And 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy come not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We have a solid foundation for our doctrine. The wise man built his house upon the rock and the rain came stumbling down. The rain came down and the splashes went up and this house stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand and the rain came tumbling down and his house fell down. I want you to understand that if you are in something that is not built upon the rock, and the rock is Jesus Christ, you are going to find yourself in problem because you are not in the truth. But if it is centered on Jesus, built upon Jesus, his death, 
burial, and resurrection, you are going to find that you are in the truth. When you talk about the death and the burial and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, you are in truth. And truth is important because the truth shall set you free. We have a solid foundation for our doctrine. The wise man builds house upon the rock. Are you convinced? And I asked this question about two weeks or three weeks ago when we began. Are you convinced that what you are in is the truth? Or do you think that there is something else? I want to tell the church tonight, I want to convince somebody tonight that you have a solid foundation on which your doctrine is established. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. What we preach, what we teach, when we come from the book of Acts, when we come from the, the New Testament scriptures, and, and we, we, we talk about the death and the burial and the ascension, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, when we talk about living holy and we talk about loving God, all these come together. These are the same things that Jesus preached about. These are the things that the prophets spoke about. These are the things that the apostles spoke about. And the scriptures say, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. I want us to understand tonight that church, we have a good footing, a good foundation on which to build. I want you to know that if the foundation is not sure, if the foundation is not well laid out, you are going to have a problem. And we spend the past couple of weeks talking about why doctrine is important, talking about how to identify true against false doctrine. So as we continue, we will look at what the apostles' doctrine is. How much time do we have? So we're just doing a, a quick look at what the apostles' doctrine is. Next week, we will get into the apostles' doctrine. And I question the Lord, God, why go so basic? You know, we want to talk about some things and, 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 and you know, but why go so basic? And I believe that the basic things are important to God. The, the, the things that, you know, we consider that, look here, we are, uh, they are important to God. This is what the church is established on, and, and I'm just going with the leading of the Holy Ghost. What is the apostles' doctrine? We had established earlier on that doctrine is simply, you know, teachings, right? Simply instructions, and it comes from the, a, a source of authority. So, so what really, it depends on who you consider to be that source of authority. But if that source of authority is not coming from the scripture, you're going to have a problem. So when we say apostles' doctrine, we are referring to the teachings and instructions of the apostle as they receive it from Jesus. Acts 2, verses 42. Let us look at that one. The Bible tells us that the first church that was ever established received the apostles' doctrine and that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Acts 2, verses 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So this was after the day of Pentecost. Peter got up and preached, and we are going to look at it. Peter got up and preached, and after he preached, they said, what shall we do? Peter told them what, was, what they should do, 
And the Bible says, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And go to 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And they continue steadfastly in the teachings and the instructions of the apostle. So the original apostles, you know, they were unpicked by Jesus Christ. When, when, when Judas betrayed Jesus, we know that, you know, Judas hanged himself. And there was an a, a opening and, you know, they cast lots and Matthias, I think, was... Was, was, was the apostle. And then the, the, the Paul was also considered as an apostle. And we, we're not getting into who is considered to an apostle and the work of an apostle, you know, and, and there are different school of thoughts and that. But, you know, these men, they were selected as apostles and they were with Jesus Christ and they, they received the teachings of Jesus Christ. These teachings that they received from Jesus Christ were the same things that they taught the people. The time the apostles spent was documented in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The implementation of that teaching can be found in the remainder of the New Testament from Acts, go to Revelation. When you look from, from, when we look at the Gospels, you know, they, 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 they document what took place during Jesus' time on earth. But from Acts, right back to Revelation, all that we find in those books were the teachings of Jesus Christ. The instructions of how we are to live. The instructions of what we should do to be saved. A vital component of the apostles' doctrine is the plan of salvation. That is what does it take or what should a man do in order to be saved from the wrath to come in response to his life of sin. God's plan for salvation for mankind is comprised in basic components. Belief, repentance, water baptism, infilling of the Holy Spirit, and living a holy life. Five basic components. And when you go through the books of Acts, right back through to Revelation, you will find the apostles preach about these components. You, you might not see it verbatim if you look in Jude. Jude might not tell you about repentance and water baptism, but Jude talk about contending for the faith, which was the same thing that was preached and accepted by man. So, we will look at each briefly, because to teach water baptism might take some time. To teach repentance and infilling of the Holy Spirit is going to take some time. And to teach holiness again is it, it, going to take some time. But what I'm going to do under the Holy Ghost is just to touch some points in, in some of these and, and, and to to have us to understand that, look here, this is the apostles' doctrine, this is what they teach, and this is what we believe, and this is what we should, should embrace, and this is what we should contend for. But then, in the coming weeks, we are going to look at the other doctrines and see how is it that they want to infiltrate, how is it that they want to cause us to, 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 to put away what God has brought us into.
So five basic things. Water baptism. Repentance. Belief. Repentance. Water baptism. In filling up the Holy Spirit. And a holy life. So we will review br um, each briefly. So, so belief in God. Is the first step. In obtaining. Eternal salvation. I'm going to read the scripture. In earlier on. Hebrews 11 verses 6. For he that cometh to God. Must first believe that. He is. And that he is a rewarder of them. That diligently seek him. Once belief is in the midst. God have what to work with. Once a person believe God. Then God has what to work with. The action is to discover what God desires of your life. And then to put those desires into a place in your life. The only place to discover this plan for your life is through the word of God. Which is the same word that we have been talking about. So once we believe God, any man comes to God must first believe. And then faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. And we mentioned that scripture earlier on. So faith plays a vital role into the saving of the soul of a man. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God. I'm going to stop here now. And next week when we get back, we will pick up right here and we will talk about faith and, and the importance of faith in our salvation. And then we look at the whole aspect of sin because you can't preach to a man and don't make him know that, look here, you are in sin. It, 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 it might be harsh if we tell somebody that, look here, you are a sinner. And, and, and people don't want to hear that they are a sinner. But the fact of the matter is that they are sinners. And, you know, we want to just look at the whole aspect of a man being a sinner. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And we're just going to, we're not getting deep into everything. We're just going to go through them. And then, you know, we look at some of the other doctrines. So, God bless you tonight. We want to thank you for tuning in. And, you know, we pray God richest blessing up, upon your soul. Not just physical blessing, but spiritual blessing. May the Lord strengthen you in the inner man. And, and may he strengthen you, guide you in the inner man. Let us just bow our heads as I dismiss in prayer. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for all that was said. We pray, Jesus Christ, because we are in serious times. And Lord Jesus, it is your intention to save souls. We are not here teaching for a show, but we are here teaching because we want men to be saved. And we pray that in a time like this, we are the adversaries seeking whom he may devour. We are there wolves in sheep clothing that as your people, we stand for truth. We stand for holiness. We stand for righteousness. We stand, mighty God, defending this heritage that has been passed down to us. We pray, mighty God, that even our very life and our very speech, hallelujah, will say to others that we are a child of God. We ask God that you continue to touch everyone that tunes in. We ask God that you bless every soul. Lord, we pray, God, for anyone that is sick and, and feeling pain. We pray that right where they are right now, that you will just grant a touch and that you will heal and that you will set free. We pray, God, even for that person that is not saved and for that person that is searching. We pray, mighty God, that you will reveal yourself to them and that you will grant repentance and cause that person to accept you for whom to know is to have life eternal. Continue to bless us, we pray, as we give you thanks right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God richly bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. 
by way of announcement, as you know, this coming Sunday is group one and group two. And by now, you would have known that, you know, there is only room for 50 persons in the service. And 25 of those persons are already accounted for. So the first 25 that calls from group one, and then the first 25 that call from group two, you are the ones that will be allowed to come in the service. God bless you. Let us continue to pray. Don't know, been praying, but don't know if things will ever get back to the norm where we can just come together as, as one congregation and, and one time. But we're praying, and it might never get back that way. But look here, look up for your redemption joy now. God bless you again in Jesus' name.